So, so Gwyneth, her background is that she was a Californian. She was born in Palo Alto. She did her PhD at Caltech with Michael Dickinson, who I think is, is, is an email is like Flyman or something. Right. Yeah, <laughs> Okay, so you know he, he, she comes from a good pedigree. She's been at Janelia now for eleven years, and she was just signed up with oh, the she's she's sure. joining uh, the news uh, institute there. So take it away. All right, thanks. Um, hello, I'm Gwyneth. Uh, thanks to uh, Terry for inviting me to come share my work with you today. I'm a biologist, so it's such a thrill actually to get to interact with this group over the next couple days, and I'm really looking forward to. Um, with your question, which I'm sure will come. So uh, as Terry mentioned, what my lab is really interested in is- Just go ahead. How, how do brains make decisions? And sort of, we think of this specifically in an ecological context, right? As an animal trying to interact with the changing world. How is it that that animal knows what the most adaptive, what the sort of right thing is to do next? How is it that our brains um, take in information about the, the world to our senses, combine that with internal information stored in our memories, um, and, and produce actions, produce these behaviors. Um, so I think the fly is a really compelling place to study this kind of question um, for several reasons. Um, one is that uh, the humble fruit fly has uh, only about on the order of 300,000 neurons, so it's sort of a tactical number. And yet with this uh, relatively compact nervous system, like the fly has to survive in the same world we do. Um, that is that it has to be able to encounter totally novel situations, interpret them and choose appropriate actions, right? So that's something that even our most advanced artificial intelligence system, you can think of sort of our type of self-driving cars, really still struggle with this kind of action selection um, question. Okay, the next reason that flies are a nice model to work with is, uh, Flies have been a genetic model of organisms for over a century now. And what does that mean? That means that we have the tools to go into their genomes and manipulate them. And specifically now, we can do that in a way that gives us a handle into the nervous system, into very specific subsets of neurons like you're seeing here. This is a single uh, neuron, the giant fiber on either side of the brain, the left and the right hand side of the brain. And so we can use these genetic tools to access them. Here, um, we've used them to, uh, to tag a, a green fluorescent protein so we can stain them so you can visualize them. As Terry alluded to, we can also use these same tools to record from them visually using optogenetics or activate them, et cetera. So we basically now have the ability to go into the brain, turn off, turn on, or monitor um, any neural cell type that we want to. And then finally, also, as, as I mentioned, um, we have a connectome of half of this uh, uh, fly brain already, and we're working towards in the next year or two, actually having a full connectome of the whole nervous system. So not just the brain, but also the fly's nerve cord. And this is the roadmap that's really the starting place uh, for trying to understand um, microcircuits and the architecture of the system and how it works um, to produce this adaptive behavior. Okay, so uh, how do we uh, approach trying to understand neural mechanisms that underlie behavior? As I mentioned, we kind of have a neurological approach and we reason that in order to be able to best interpret and understand signals that are in the middle of the brain, which is the part that's been most accessible and inaccessible in larger organisms, it helps to study something the brain actually evolved to do. So here's something that the fly's brain um, has evolved to handle, and that is attacked by a predator. Uh, so what you're seeing here is a damsel fly that was um, hand captured by one of my students in the Janelia pond, and this damsel fly is attacking these dark black smudges, which are in fact Drosophila. Just sitting there, Drosophila just sitting there, right? It's not flying at this point. Right? That's right, yeah, the Drosophila are just sitting there, and it's one of the reasons we use damsel flies because they will actually do what's called gleaning. They'll actually try to attack these Drosophila birds just sitting on the side of this cage. And what I hope you can see is that um, this fly that is being targeted, in fact, does successfully get away from the damsel fly. Yeah. Um, so how does it do this? I should say that this is a high-speed video that was recorded at 1,000 frames per second. So you're seeing it considerably slowed down um, for real time. Well, in order to try to understand this from the fly's perspective, um, what we did was we wanted a way to measure lots of flies responding to this type of uh, predator attack. 
um, this kind of approach uh, that the, the damselfly is doing creates a looming stimulus, right? A dark shadow expanding on the fly's retina. Okay, so we need to show flies a lot of looming stimuli um, no, and but, measure but the response. Isn't it remarkable that the rest of them don't even move? I mean, so, there's a big predator there, and they just stay, stick around, right? Yeah, right. I don't know if you noticed, there was one other one, one, like, other one yeah. right, that, that moved, but yes, most of them don't. And so that's, in fact, um, one of the things we're really interested in, right? Because it's quite energetically costly oh, for a fly to escape, right? So it, it wants to actually be able to discern whether it's the attacked fly or whether the looming stimulus it sees isn't that's on a collision course. So expensive to get away there. That's right. And so actually, I won't get into it today, but it's an ongoing project where we're now trying to figure out which specific circuits uh, make that distinction between a direct attack and a peripheral attack. Um, okay, but so how do we even measure this behavior? Uh, well, we built a device to automatically deliver flies out of a fly vial that's shown at the bottom and kind of clear in this video up to uh, up near where it says sweeper. There's actually a small little platform that's about fly size that the flies can, can sit on. And we wanted to be able to do this automatically so that we can report hundreds, even thousands of flies per day. And so uh, the way this works is that um, the flies go one at a time upwards against gravity with an innate response they have. They're, they're funneled into this little tunnel where a gate lets one fly at a time through. We have a little photodiode array um, that detects the shadow of the fly going through the tunnel. We can close the gate behind a single fly. We get a single fly up on the platform. We then take that fly and we surround it with a spherical projection screen. So here's the spherical projection screen, kind of a dome on that for flies. And then what we're going to show on this um, projection screen is we're going to project expanding dark circles that expand at the rate that we measure that the, the actual predator, the damselfly, attacks the fly. So the circle is a little bit of an abstract. The damselfly, but sort of the kinematics of the looming are very. So, so I have a question about the damselfly. How? What's the success rate? Oh, okay, great question. So um, when we, we did our population case experiments, uh, not in a way where we could measure that completely accurately because we were just hand triggering uh, videos to capture events. But uh, over the course of a day, we captured uh, basically in equal thirds, a third of the time the damn fly was successful, a third of the time the fly got away, and then a third of the times the damn fly captured the fly, but the fly wriggled and was able to get loose after being caught. So, oh, so, there's, so there's additional um, escape behaviors there. That's right. Yeah, that's right. But I, but I, I thought these dragonflies, I don't know if damselfly, but I, everybody else claimed they have 90% success rate. So that's dragonflies that are catching flies on the wing. Oh, I see. And Drosophila are fairly poor flyers, oh, I especially see. when compared to a dragonfly. I see. They're not as fast or maneuverable. Um, they can't back up, right? They, they, they can fly backwards. Really? Yeah. Um, and they can hover. Uh, but not with nearly the sort of speed and acceleration agile, you're saying. of the dragonfly. Yeah, they're not as agile. Exactly. They're not, as, they're not as agile. No, I mean, when they're flying around a banana in your kitchen, you can see that they're not very quick. Exactly. There's, it's not like a houseboy. That's what I see. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay, so here's this video showing you what this um, experiment looks like. So we show these looming stimuli to these flies, these flies on the platform. We have two camera views, a uh, sort of side view and a bottom view that we can record. And so what this lets us do is, as I said, try to capture many repeats uh, of how the flies are responding to get a kind of idea across the oh, number of flies. How do flies respond um, to looming stimuli? Oh, look, okay, I do have mouse. Great. Okay, so this is just a, you know a video to give you a sense of you know some of the diversity of the response. You can see by raise their wings at kind of different times. They took off in all directions. Can you play it again? Sure. And yeah, sorry, the videos are playing a little bit slowly. Um, these video, particular videos are actually synchronized to the time of takeoff, so you're not getting latency information here. But you can see that some of the flies raise their wings pretty early, and other ones uh, not quite as early. Um, I should say that when we really crank this machine up to go, um, we've been able to record upwards of 2,500 videos per day. So, you know, we're that's going to help us get a lot of statistical purchase on this. Um, I won't talk about all of that today, but one of the reasons we need that under we, we can use this apparatus to then screen through our genetic lines, right? So that's one of the ways that we're going to start getting footholds into the circuits. We're going to go in and we're going to silence different individual neurons 
and then run this experiment and see where we see uh, a phenotype that is different from uh, the normal behavior. Okay, but in general, just to kind of paint a picture for you of what does a fly do when it sees a predator attacking it, well, it actually has this small repertoire of uh, reactions from what it can choose. And so the thing to take away from it uh, right now is that the flies don't do sort of a knee-jerk reaction, uh, one thing, uh, when they see a predator attacking, they're actually selecting um, from a, a small set of reactions. So for example, they might freeze, they might simply just stop and not move. That's very similar to what a mouse does when it sees a looming stimulus. They might um, just turn away from the looming stimulus and actually walk away or just hunger down and crouch down. They do some um, actual movements of their legs and their bodies and postural adjustment. And as you saw in those other videos, they can raise their wings and, and take off and initiate flight. They also can string these uh, different uh, actions together into a small sequence. Um, and so here's an example um, from a fly that I recorded long ago when I was at Michael Dickinson's lab. You'll see that what it's, it's doing is it starts by it's grooming its hind um, with its hind legs. And then the loom is gonna approach from the left side of the screen. And the first thing the fly does is it stops this grooming behavior and sets all of its legs down and kind of breaks pause. It's then going to move these middle legs very specifically towards the looming stimulus. And then it's going to extend them and push off the ground. So that's its kind of, uh, it's, yeah. So, uh, <clears throat> very interesting. I know for the blow fly, when they jump, they are completely blind because 95% of the energy that they are expending goes to actually jump, which are actually flying. Is that the same for the... That, that's a good question. So uh, what I can tell you is that we initially, after the flies jump, they're on a fairly ballistic trajectory. Mm -hmm. And so there, we don't have any evidence that they're, say, using vision to change their trajectory right away. But I also don't know whether that's more biomechanical or more because they can't see. So we haven't studied that. Um, but, but as you say, mm -hmm. initiating flight is probably one of the most costly things that a fly does, even for these flies, but they're, they're very good at detecting motion, right? I mean, that's they what are. they're good at. Yes. So my guess is that you know, why would you turn that off? No, but uh, Andreas is saying somehow that the power supply drops so much. Yeah, no, they only they, they can't they see. They cannot afford to supply energy to the vision system. No, but Andreas, for a few, at least for a few milliseconds, their cell will stop. Oh, right. But that's how you can. That's why we should be trying the fly because they cannot see. No, I don't believe that. Well, I don't it's have a definitive right. answer. Okay, okay. We'll have I'll to keep your reference. <laughs> okay, so each of these different sub behaviors that the fly can do in response to looming stimulus has different consequences for the, the behavior of the fly. So, for example, that jumping, that pushing off the ground, that's actually where the flies are getting their power from. So, this is just to show you flies that uh, we tested that had. Um, they're completely intact with both their legs and their wings versus ones that cut their wings off and they only had their legs. You can see this takeoff velocity is the same. In other words, the wings aren't necessarily helping to power that initial jump. Okay, so what are the wings doing? Why would the fly bother to take the extra five, 10, maybe even more milliseconds to raise the wings? Uh, well, we think they're being used for stability. So if you measure the angular velocity around all three body axes as the flies um, put up into the air, what you can see is for flies, that were able to get their wings up, that angular velocity is pretty low, whereas those that didn't get their wings up, that angular velocity is higher. And um, this is more directly observable in the case where I if I show you what a fly looks like where we cut off its wings and then show it a looming stimulus, um, this is what happens. So the fly is completely <laughs> unstable about its full axis. And so we think that those wings are basically to enhance that stability on takeoff. You can imagine there might be several advantages to the fly to be able to do that. It doesn't have to spend energy correcting um, its trajectory. It can maintain its trajectory in a particular direction. So for that re reason, the wings might be beneficial. Um, however, what I'm going to talk to you about in the first part of the talk is actually the trade-off that the fly is going to make between two different types of takeoff, the kind where it does take the time to raise its wings and the kind where it doesn't and it jumps off really quickly, how is the nervous system actually arbitrating in which cases it should choose um, either of those kinds of takeoff? Okay, and then in the second part of the talk, which we'll see if we get to, hopefully we will, I'll talk to you about another aspect of what the fly is doing uh, when it sees a predator, which is it's actually controlling the direction in which it escapes and it does this through those postural adjustments that I showed you. So um, this is data showing you that uh, for whatever direction of looming stimulus relative to the fly that we show the fly, that's the color code here. 
um, each arrow now is the direction that a fly took off. And you can sort of see um, just from this visualization that if we show looming stimuli from the left of the fly, they roughly take off to the right. Um, if we show looming stimuli from the front, they roughly take off to the back, et cetera. We've actually um, modeled this psychometric curve um, more exactly, and you can basically replicate the direction the fly jumps by taking a simple vector sum between 180 degrees away from the location of the stimulus and a forward facing direction in the body axis of the fly. In other words, there's some bias for the fly to jump forward, but it will then add on to jumping away from the, um, the stimulus. Okay, and so how is it doing that? Well, by looking at these hundreds of videos um, in close detail, what we found is that that postural adjustment that the fly is doing actually appears to be moving its center of mass to particular uh, target locations relative to its two middle jumping legs. And so what these are color-coded for now is not the direction of the stimulus, but the direction the fly is gonna jump. And so what you can see is that the center of mass location relative to this vertical axis, which is the two jumping legs, is very predictive of the direction that the fly is gonna jump. Um, so we think that those um, postural adjustments are what are critical for the sort of um, uh, control of this uh, jumping direction. And so, we haven't uh, directly put it into this framework, but what I think this kind of represents here that the fly is doing, right, it's basically a speed accuracy trade-off. So flies can be fast um, or they can be more accurate in the direction they jump. And I'll just show you a little bit of data um, that I think demonstrates that. So I told you that flies have a slight bias to jump forward. So what I'm showing you here are uh, cases in which uh, we, we have the stimulus come through the back of the fly, in other words, its forward direction and the direction away from the stimulus are one and the same. And you can see on the excess axis here, no matter how fast the looming stimulus comes, um, the fly is always able to sort of successfully control its direction. However, in the case where we do the opposite, and now we have the stimulus coming from the front of the fly, right, so we have to kind of do the maximal posture adjustment in order to get the correct directional control. You can see that as the stimulus comes um, faster, uh, then the fly is uh, no longer able to really control that direction. So the fly is having to make this choice between should I get off the ground quickly or should I take the time to do this postural adjustment and be more accurate in getting away from the predator. Okay, and then I also just like to point out at this point that you know this is not a strategy that's necessarily esoteric to flies. So here's a video from YouTube of a gentleman walking down the street who's about to be confronted with an unexpected booming stimulus he's probably <laughs> never seen before. Play it again. So it's going to play back in slow motion in just a second. And what you'll see is he uses exactly the same behavioral algorithm of the fly. He's going to lean over, adjust his posture, such as his legs are closer to the looming stimulus and the center of mass, such that at the end, when he pushes off the ground, he's able to direct himself away from the threat. And who's that dude getting out with the car? <laughs> <laughs> I'm clear. So I know nothing more about this scenario <laughs> other than to say. Right. <laughs> 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 It's another reason why studying escape and sort of like a visual threat behavior is kind of compelling because these are things that basically all living organisms have to deal with. And so there's some question about whether sort of these superficial behavioral algorithmic similarities might belie some underlying actual neural computation. Well, and so, so blooming stimuli also lead to escape responses in humans. Or, yes. And, you know, it's, it's, it's without thinking, you just basically... Collision responses. Yeah. That's, that's right. There's some really fun um, uh, psychophysics studies of babies of crouching in response to the new thing. Like, yeah, it's, it's very innate. Yeah. And very also, cool. I think that all, some basic uh, things like snake detectors are built in. Like in dark situation, when you see the snake thing, it's built in. You say, oh, you know? Yes. No, Betsy Murray in our lab uses snakes to condition our monkeys. Yeah. Our monkeys do and it's based on the innate desire to stay away from okay, the yeah. But yeah, that's a question I've done. But with these flies and these moving, like how much of this is the hardware reflex and how much is it actually the active thinking and decision making? Yeah, great question. So um, I think what I'm going to show you today, and we can discuss it, is that it's both. Right. So actually, and this is a little bit related to what John was saying yesterday in terms of wanting to have diverse components, right? Wanting to have um, sort of high and low systems come together. I think even in sort of a very rapid innate reaction to this in the fly, 
both are going on. There is a very fast pathway, which I'll talk about, but there are also slower pathways that involve more processing and more competition. And I didn't pay you to say that. <laughs> but you can afterwards. <laughs> Um, okay, so let's try to get into the nervous system. I've laid out for you a sort of behavioral system that we think is approachable. How can we actually start to figure out which parts of the nervous system are involved in enacting these choices between the small repertoire of looming responses? So uh, our approach is to fly, um, even though we potentially could go in anywhere, um, there's still you know, potentially 300,000 neurons to survey. So that would still take a long time. But we reason that light which comes in at the photoreceptors in the eye, uh, which is this part. So this is the fly nervous system, right? This is the optic lobe of the fly, and this is the retina. So light comes in here. If that information from light is eventually going to lead to the leg and wing movement of these actions, it must generally pass through this path, right? It has to go through the optic lobe, into the central brain, down through the neck of the fly, into the ventral nerve cord. And there are two, at least two critical bottlenecks along this path. One is the point at which information comes out of the optic lobe and goes into the central brain. Turns out there's only about 100 cell types um, that carry that information. And the other is in the actual neck of the fly where information has to move from the central brain down into the nerve cord. Um, we now know that there's only about um, 1,600 uh, neurons that carry all of that information. You mean the whole neck only has 1,600 neurons? That's the descending. It then also has more ATP. Oh, I see. So actually, the whole neck has about 3,000. Okay. Yeah. Actually, it's fewer than 1,600. I take it back because it's about 650 per side. It's about 1,300 descending there. And are those all those fat neurons that you were talking about, or is this part of the mixture of different fat axons? Huge variation of axons. Huh? Yes. Yeah. A whole bunch of different. Huge variation. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I, I Actually, I meant to to show you by the cross section of the neck, because it's incredibly compelling. If you take sort of the oval, that is the cross section of the neck, these giant fibers that I'm gonna to talk to you about today take up maybe like 10% of that cross section. Okay. And then there's lots of other little, oh. so, yeah. How about the photoreceptor as being the bottom fundamentally, for everything that happens? Yeah. The latency, so, no, so, no, information capacity. That, that's absolutely true for a different kind of question. For us, we wanted to know after the photoreceptor what other neurons are involved. I see. Right. So that so this is merely bottlenecks in terms of trying to get hooked into the central circuits that are involved. Um, so uh, we and our colleagues at Genelia worked on creating genetic driver lines specifically targeting uh, neural cell types in these two bottlenecks. Can so, you explain what a, a driver line is? Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> so. Um, in fly, uh, you can take the promoter for a given gene and you can express it um, in the fly, uh, sort of not naturally, such that that promoter will turn on whenever that gene is expressed. Okay, so what does that mean? That means if you happen to have a cell anywhere in the body of the organism it's, that would sort of naturally turn on that gene, then it also turns on your promoter, which you use to then drive more sort of um, synthetic DNA that you put in, it can turn on anything you want, a green fluorescent protein, a channel redoxin, um, any kind of tool of your choice. And so what Jerry Rubin pioneered at, Gen at Genelia, which is really the basis for all of this work, is he had the idea, okay, I can just go in and look up genes that tend to be expressed in the nervous system of life, and that would be a good set to target to try to get specific expression in the nervous system. So that was Jerry Rubin's um, first pass at making a set of what we call driver lines. Driver lines are sort of specific promoter driving specific genes. However, that didn't get the expression patterns specific enough, specific as, as these are to sort of individual cell types. So uh, they then used a system, I think, I believe pioneered by Barry White at NIH, which is this um, split cell four system in which you basically can have now combinatorial promoters. So now you're, you don't just have one, you express two promoters in a certain way using phylogenetics, and only where you have the overlap of expression of those two genes, do you now get something to bring into light up or some neuron to turn on. And so if I'm being a little bit cavalier mm -hmm. about how easy these genetic tools are to use. In fact, it's quite laborious yeah. to go through and make these combinatorial driver lines because what a person has to do, it can be aided by computer, but at the end, a person has to go through, look at expression patterns of individual genes, try to visually identify where the same neuron is expressed in two different patterns, and then make the genetics to 
combine those two patterns and seeing if you can narrow down the expression pattern. So all of these um, have been sort of hand designed as it were um, by, by a set of people. In this case, the credit really goes to this really talented um, neuroanatomist, uh, Alyosha Nern, who, who worked on the object load in, in Jerry uh, Rubin's lab. And so what Alyosha was able to make is this set of driver lines here, um, which target a subset of these uh, visual projection neurons coming out of the optic lobe um, called LC neurons. How many driver lines do you have? Um, so Jerry initially made 7,000 of the less specific driver lines. And we've now whittled that down to about three to 4,000 of these really nice ones. So we have three to 4,000 like pretty good looking genetic driver lines for different types of neurons. Uh, different cell types. So each one of these patterns isn't a single neuron like the one I showed you before. These are actually small populations of you know, 50 to 100 neurons. So you can imagine you have 3,000 of those. You're covering actually a fair number of, of neurons in the fine nervous system. Okay, so that's one set of genetic tools that we use. And then the other set is a, a set that um, a team that I was involved in made specifically targeting the descending neurons. And so the, unlike these that I just told you were sort of small populations, the descending neurons, um, at least half of them tend to be very unique morphologies that you can identify um, specifically from fly to fly. And so many of these driver lines target just single neurons along the left and right side of the sort of bilateral pair. Okay, so let me start this excursion into the nervous system um, from the visual side. Um, okay, so here is a picture of the fly brain. There are some uh, different nerve pill regions with subregions of the brain outlined here. But to simplify this for you, uh, I just want to sort of summarize where I think our state of understanding of, of visual pathways in the central brain are, which is that I think there's basically three primary visual pathways going from the optic lobe into the central brain. One is the one I'll talk to you most about today, which is the sort of very direct pathway through these LC neurons that I just showed you pictures of directly onto descending neurons or other neurons in this kind of lateral area here. Then there are two other pathways going to higher order neuro pills. Um, one actually breaks off um, earlier uh, in the optic lobe, so it takes uh, less refined information and goes into the central complex of the fly, and another one um, goes through the mushroom bodies. And so uh, our, our lab doesn't work on this as much right now, but the central complex and the mushroom body are probably the best studied parts of the fly brain. They're sort of the highest order parts of the fly brain, and they've been very uh, closely associated with uh, navigation and associative memory perspective. So, which pathway has these uh, wide field neurons that, you know, by the way, you know, there's a long history in neuromorphic engineering of trying to build uh, electronic versions of the fly uh, visual system and these uh, uh, elementary motion detectors and the wide field neurons yes. that sense the optical slip. Yes. That's the first one, right? That's the first one. That's right. So you have these large, large, uh, these horizontal cells and vertical cells. That's right. That's right. All of the LPTCs is what are called. The BL, BLMP. That's this, that's this region, that's this region here that, that they go to. They go to the central lateral yeah. nerve region. The other ones are not studied at all in their morphic engineering at all. Zero. Not as much, but um, modeling is really picking up for these two areas. Um, the central complex, especially um, in the last five years, has been very exciting because it's emerged as a place where there seems to be a representation of heading direction in the yeah. fly. Um, really, the really, strings, the yeah, structure. that's right. Uh, yeah. really anyway, that's, that is right for your work, because the, the whole circuit is now known, right? Just about. They Just know, about. They know um, several of the very primary cell types. Well, it's in a computational model. That's right. Computational model, yeah. That's right. Yeah, are they giving off collaterals on, and you follow them through? So, okay, so that's a really uh, interesting question. I'm going to answer it. You'll see images in, in okay. just a second. Um, so, but the short answer is no. The visual neurons aren't giving off collaterals, um, but the descending neurons are. Um, but okay, so let, but let me dig into that um, a little bit more. Okay, so um, let me tell you a little bit more about the fly visual system for those of you who aren't as well acquainted with it. 
Um, although, you know, as Toby mentioned, it, sort of, it has been- But you can tell this audience for sure, yeah. A, a paragon of um, motion detection uh, specifically, but okay, so the, the fly, unlike our eye, the fly has a compound eye, which means in Drosophila, which is different from the blowfly, it's got about 700 different facets on its eye. Um, and that, that uh, form this kind of uh, columnar organization, um, which is carried on through these successive layers of the optic lobe, um, from the retina to the lamina and the medulla, until you get to these two final layers, the lobula and the lobular plate. So these, the lobula and the lobular plate also have this columnar structure. And there's sort of two flavors of neurons coming out of the lobula and the lobular plate going into the central brain that have been well studied. One are the set that um, Toby mentioned, which are actually what are part, which are depicted here. These are the horizontal system cells, and these are broad neurons. So each each one of these, you can see, there's three that cover all of retinotopic space here, right? So that's what's represented across the nerve hill. And um, some really nice work by um, Holger Krapp and others um, a few decades ago discerned that basically what these tangential cells were representing were different patterns of optic flow. So these um, wide branches of these dendrites are reaching out to different columns of visual space, um, which compute different directions of motion and specifically composing patterns of optic flow that they can integrate such that each individual neuron would respond most strongly when the fly makes a particular rotation about its body axis. And so these are thought to be engaged um, primarily during flight when the fly is making rapid steering maneuvers, um, likely, many of them actually even going to the neck motor system of the animal because the, the head of the fly, right, has to be controlled relative to the body, yeah. Yeah, just a quick question that relates to something that probably uh, alluded earlier. Different flies have different speed, you know, the faster or slow. Where does this fall in the category of how fast it can respond and reacts to things and what Yeah, okay, great question. So um, even though the, the biomechanical top flight speed of a Drosophila is lower than a, a dragonfly, so that's kind of where we we're talking slow before, the visual system and the re reactions are still incredibly fast. I see. So um, Michael Dickinson <clears throat> has a really nice um, science paper, uh, I don't know, from five to 10 years ago, where they took high-speed video of uh, flies in flight responding to moving stimuli, and you can see that in a matter of a few wing strokes, and so the fly beats wings at 200 hertz, the fly is able to you know, see the looming stimulus and respond with a turn. So, so this is happening in sort of tens, you know, may, maybe up to 100. In the software. In the software, yeah. Yes. Yeah, oh, yeah. Wow. Exactly. very fast. That said, the vision is still the slowest part of what's happening. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Because uh, you can see how many layers of processing are, are in the optic. Um, okay, these are not what I'm going to talk about today. These neurons coming out of blood. Like, I'm going to talk about LC neurons, <laughs> lumbar neurons, which are the population of smaller field visual neurons um, that have their dendrites largely in this um, nerve hill called the lobula. There is one I'll tell you about that, that has its neurons in the lobular plate, but it's, it's supposed to be wide field tangential cells. They're small field um, neurons. Okay, um, and so they tend to be uh, populations like this. So this is like a little cartoon that's showing you um, small field dendrites in the lobula, then extending to, into the, the central brain, and this comes to your question, uh, an area for each of them called an optic glomerulus. So in other words, these uh, LC neurons, what's characteristic about them is that each individual member of the population is sampling a different point in visual space, but their, bun their bundled axons actually don't branch out in the central brain. They go to very specific different glomeruli. So what these different colors here are, are they're showing you the location of the different bundled axons or the different glomeruli for different ones of these LC neurons. So this black thing is a cartoon, but these are actually real ROIs taken from uh, uh, conectomic data to show you kind of where those objects in really are. So you think of this as a map? Yes, exactly. And I'm going to show you what that map is about. Um, okay, and I'll just throw out there that one interesting thing um, that Alyosha observed when he first saw these is that in fact, whereas, you know, there's sort of exquisite retinotopy preserved through this full optic lobe, um, the minute you get to the, to the glomeruli, that retinotopy appears to be thrown away. 
And so here was his observation. He could um, observe individual ones of a particular LC type. So these are colored in different colors here. And then he could look at where they terminated in their particular glomerulus. And so you can see that the colors basically are mixed up, right? There's no, uh, at least at this level, preserved retina toppy in the glomerulus. And that long ago led some neuroanatomists such as Nick Stroudsell to conjecture, okay, so maybe this particular set of LC neurons isn't about um, communicating location of a stimulus. It's actually about some kind of higher order visual feature um, that is being represented here uh, across these glomeruli. So we were interested in that and a really talented postdoc uh, between my lab and Michael Reiser's lab at Janelia sent out to study that. So here is a uh, some illustration of that, of these different optic glomeruli with the different cell types uh, labeled here. And I'll, I'll show you sort of a, a small version first. Basically, what Nathan did was he um, imaged from these different um, cell types, and he found that, in fact, they did seem to encode um, different kinds of uh, visual features. So here's one LPLT2 that responds really strongly um, to looming stimuli, but not to other kinds of visual stimuli. Here's another one. Oops. That, that was me, I clicked, oh, it was me, I clicked the mouse. Okay. It's okay today, huh? Here's another one that responds to, uh, to thin moving lines, but not as much to points or looming stimuli. And finally, a third one that seems to be a point detector. So, so based on that kind of preliminary study, we decided to do this more thoroughly. And we said, well, can we just go in and sort of map all of them? And so uh, Nathan did that for 10 of the 20 cell types for which we had really good clean genetic driver lines, um, especially what he wanted to do was he wanted to be able to not measure responses in the glomerulus. Remember, the glomerulus is a mix of, say, 50 to 100 different neurons. He wanted to measure the specific responses of an individual LC neuron, and he's going to do that by finding a place where he can isolate visually the axon in order to, um, to, to best see the calcium responses. I mean, in this has totally changed everything because it was, in the past it was impossible to record these neurons, right? Because they were so small. I mean, they're not spiking, right? That's right. They're That's not right. spiking. And it was impossible to do intracellular recordings. The longest recording anybody could do was like 60 seconds or something. This yeah. totally changed everything, right? So being able to do these kinds of functional imaging optically yeah. it is, is amazing. And, and Nathan was really talented because he really pushed it to, to still get down to the individual cell level, which meant that what he did for his experiments is he actually did sort of a preliminary set of data where he was then going to center his um, visual stimuli on exactly you know, the neuron for which he was reporting the ROI. So you're going to see our data centered on a particular individual so, neuron. Region of ROI. Interest. Sorry. Oh yeah. Region of interest, right? The receptive field. Or so no, in this case, I just mean purely um, from the calcium imaging, right? Oh, so this is the picture he's using his microscope, and he's going to pick a region of interest which to check pixel changes, which are present calcium. What were you saying, sir? No. You just clarify, I think. How exactly is this imaging plan? Okay, yeah, I think I didn't um, put the cartoon here. Thank you for that question. So we take the flies and we um, head fix them to a little plastic plate. And the plastic plate, um, it's flat, but then it has a part where it has a little pyramid coming down um, with a hole in the bottom, a, a, an upside down pyramid with a hole in the bottom. So we tilt the flies head forward. We put that hole right in the back of its head. We remove the back of the cuticle such that we expose this part of the brain. Um, and the reason that we have that little pyramid is that it makes the configuration so that the fly in theory could fly. It still sort of has the freedom to move. And in this particular set of experiments Nathan did, the fly wasn't flying or behaving in any way. He's just um, recording visual responses. But we then surround the fly with a curved screen, similar to the one we use in behavior, and we show visual stimuli. And so this yeah. is, yeah, go ahead. And then you know that the cells are filled with something so that when the uh, cell is activated, calcium rushes in, and then it changes the fluorescence of the cell, right? And that's what you're seeing. You're seeing the calcium change, right? Yeah, thank you. So then we use our genetic driver lines to express um, this uh, protein called GCAMP, um, which is basically a calcium sensor such that when calcium is detected, it fluoresces, and we can use a two photon microscope to detect that fluorescence change and basically make <laughs> movies of it over time. And then we're going to um, to to measure find how that changes in a particular uh, area of what we can see that we think is the axon of a visual neuron. 
But we have this like calcium indicator in all cells only no cells? no that's where the genetic uh, driver comes in so we're able to narrow it down to just our cell type of interest so we can really get special things. okay so uh nathan then showed a battery of 100 different uh, types of visual stimuli there's sort of um, a few types sort of summarized here um to these different uh cell types and and this is what he saw i mean he had to handcraft these he had to handcraft these right that's right just to try to guess i mean you know what it might respond to. That's right. Yeah. So, so we tried uh, basically to, to cover the, the basis of what you know visual neurons and lives responded to before. So, wide field types of uh, movement, yeah. lateral rotation, individual small dots moving around, long lines moving around, darkening, lightening, looming, contraction. Um, you know, it's I wouldn't think that's what it might be, right? That's right, yeah. exactly. So um, I should say, you know, I, I think there are really interesting ways to do this um, in, in a sort of a more agnostic way that we're sort of interested in approaching, but I think this covers the basis. So you missed Steve Zucker's talk yesterday morning where he showed that in the mouse, that if you just stick with these stimuli, you miss some very important textured stimuli that actually have much better spatial resolution that drive different types of uh, ganglion cells. Yeah. So, you know, it, it might be worth taking a look at that paper with Mike Stryker. Yeah, okay, thanks. Yeah, that's a good suggestion. Um, yeah, absolutely. We, we And, you know, these aren't necessarily ecological either, right? So I, I think there's um, a next round to be done. Um, but already it was fairly striking, a couple of things. One is that you can see the half of the neurons, uh, cell types that we measured, basically seem to strongly respond to looming stimuli, you know, particularly dark looming. Um, whereas these other half don't, and instead seem to like um, particularly small uh, features, whether they're thin lines or, or thin dots. And I, I won't talk about it too much today, but I'm happy to put you in touch with Nathan if you're, if you're curious, because Nathan's been working on models of how, how some of these fine object detection might work. But you know, just to point out, LC18 in particular, it responds to small moving dots in the five environment that are smaller than the visual resolution of the five compound eye, right? So the compound eye has about a five degree resolution and, and LC18 really likes these four and a half degree um, squares moving around. So there's some interesting things there. Um, but kind of coming back to this idea of, is it a map? Um, what we did is we kind of uh, loosely grouped these into two types, ones that like small objects and ones that like looming, um, and then we looked at, well, going back to our optic glomerularly uh, layout in the slide's brain, where are these actually located? And, um, you know, roughly they're, they're located together. So the ones that like small objects are kind of close to each other, and the ones that are most responsive to looming stimuli are close to, yeah, to each other. So, so I have to, this is yeah. historical. Uh, there's a famous paper where the frog's eye tells the frog's brain. Uh, left in the middle. Yeah. And, and one of the things they discovered was that in the, the frog's eye, there's a ganglion cell that responds to small little spots like that. And, and they called it a fly detector. That's so right. this is now a fly detector in a fly. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. And, and so I think, I think that tells you actually in some ways how conserved some of these categories might be, right? Even though the fly is not a predator of other flies, it still needs to have a bug detector. I mean, it needs no constant physics are coming towards it to potentially mate with them, right? Um, so yeah, I think it's interesting. I also like to note, that I like that paper that, you know, now we have found the fly's frog detector. So we have the... <laughs> um, okay, so, you know, I'll, I'll maybe skip this a little bit because I'm running short on time. We haven't kind of got, even gotten to the circuit, but um, we were sort of interested that what was important, of course, is the next layer of consideration. So, um, Great, it's great to have a map. Why would you have a map? You know, one strong hypothesis would be to sort of minimize wiring. What? So, what are you minimizing wiring for? Whatever computation you need to do downstream. And uh, I'll gloss through this a little bit quickly, but kind of long story short, just from our preliminary observations, um, it looks like um, the most common motif downstream is for downstream neurons to integrate from pairs of these cell types, and that the pairs they integrate from tend to be of the same general class. So. They might integrate two looming detectors. They may integrate two sort of small object detectors. That seems to be the most common. That's kind of what this um, matrix is showing you here. Um, so the two axes are the different cell types? That's and right. And the color means... Uh, how, well, so basically white means that they have uh, more, they have more synapses onto a common downstream partners. 
Well, it's sign out to actually common. Okay. So like um else, is on the left. Uh so it's it's asymmetric just because it's sort of looking at like of L, of all the, the um downstream partners of LC17, that would be a this, you know. Which of these other descending, uh, which of these other visual projection neurons also have common downstream partners, and then how strong is the overlap in the number of synapses they send? Um, and so these, you know, so I'll, for example, I'm about to tell you about LPLC2 and LP4, which are two looming detecting uh, visual projection cell types. So you can see they they have um, a lot in common. Um, but let me move on a little bit because I want to get to to actually more farther into the circuit. Okay, so let me come back to the specific behavioral choice we're gonna try to understand the neural mechanism of. And that is what I alluded to before, this decision the fly has to make about whether to do a kind of rapid takeoff that leads to tumbling, we call that the short mode takeoff, or whether to take the time to elevate its wings, enhance stability during the takeoff, we call that the long mode takeoff. And um, we think that these are sort of two very distinct modes the fly does, because if you look at how long the fly um, takes for its whole takeoff duration, you basically get this bimodal distribution. And if you look at it, should not use that. If you look at um, sort of example videos from these two different modes of the distribution, what you see is that um, in the short mode, the fly is not raising its wings, whereas in the long mode, the fly is raising its wings. So that's kind of the difference in time. Does the fly take the time to raise its wings? So how is the nervous system arbitrating this? Oh, I guess I should say, I'm not showing you the data, but you know, as you might expect ecologically, as the stimulus comes faster and faster, so the predator attacks faster, the fly biases its decision to do this mode more than the long mode. Okay, so, so yeah. It looks like the short mode is the slower. The the, so the short mode, by slower, do you mean? Um, Take the video the videos. So the short mode actually, like this is the duration here. That, so these are the, the numbers. This is the duration of how long the whole behavioral sequence lasts. And this is a log, a log um, axis. So you can see that actually. So it's just not the takeoff, it's what it does after the takeoff as well. You mean, sorry. Just is it, this is not the latency to takeoff. This is not the latency. It's a sequence. The sequence. That's right. So are those two images synchronous? So, okay, yeah, sorry. Let me go back. I, I was trying to play them again and they weren't playing. So they're synchronized to the point of takeoff. So again, you're, they're not giving you information about the latency. And in fact, there is some difference in latency, but it's not as clear as you might think because there's a couple hundred milliseconds spread in the latency, which is something for another project that we can we can get to. But, but that's why we plotted here, just the actual time of the motor program. So it, it you know, basically on average, um, the fly can shave eight milliseconds off its motor program by not raising its wings. Okay, so um, we went through and we silenced a bunch of the neurons of the type I, I told you about, and we tried to look at flies responding to looming, and um, this is what we saw. So here's the bimodal distribution um, that I just showed you. If you silence these giant fibers, these giant descending neurons, then the short mode distribution totally drops out. So previous to our work, there was a lot of work done on the giant fiber, and people had sort of... Um, generally associated it with fly takeoff. And I think the story was like, that's how flies take off, right? They're these reflex machines that use giant fiber to take off. Um, but what we found is that if you silence giant fiber, flies can take off just fine. They can respond to the innate stimuli and escape, no, no problem. They just lose this particular mode of the behavior. Conversely, if we use our genetic tools to um, optogenetically activate the giant fiber, we only drive short mode takeoffs. So it seems like these giant fibers are responsible for this particular rapid um, takeoff mode. Okay, and so we were then interested in, okay, so what is the information coming into the giant fiber that would help the fly determine when to use that um, rapid takeoff mode or not? So we went back to the sort of connectome data. So connectome data is generated from electron microscopy of volumes of the fly brain. Here's a beautiful one collected by my colleague, Dobby Bach. At the time we did this study, we didn't have the, the dozens of people who had already gone in. We actually had to go in by hand ourselves and um, uh, had a really talented group of people who just traced profiles of the particular neurons we were interested in from this um, sort of uh, sea of neurons. And so what you're about to see are um, in uh, magenta, the giant fiber neuron dendrites itself, and then in cyan and yellow, the um, 
the axon terminals of two LC neurons, LC4 and LC2. And so long story short, what we found from this study is that in fact, there are two of these moving responses of visual projection neurons that synapse directly onto the giant fiber. And what was very helpful for us experimentally is to know that there were two and only two. But so, what is that? Yeah, that's that's just remarkable. By the way, I mean, this just shows how the electron, you know, electrical engineers, just how what a dense like mess it is in there, right? Just to work this yeah. out, it's just amazing. But when you lit up these different pieces, these are different uh, dendritic inputs, or what are they? Can just yeah, yeah. So here's the cartoon of it. So what you were seeing there is you were seeing yeah. the dendrites of the giant yeah. fiber. And then you were seeing the axon terminals in uh, you know, yellow of the LPLT2 and in blue of LT4. So we could then go in and count the number of synapses, um, et cetera, um, of, and to figure out sort of the input to the giant fiber. So it's also worth pointing out, you mentioned neurofilm before. Neurofilm is the dense synaptic dendritic interactions that are occurring in the, in the center. Uh, and then the cell bodies are actually uh, surrounding that. That's and right. Orion. It's so it's a very different, it's a very different. Oh, I see. Okay, yeah. it's, it's like a ball oh, yeah. and you have all the cell bodies on the outside because all the action is taking place inside in the neurofilm and with the, uh, you know, with, with the graded potentials. Not with the oh, yeah. But these yeah. little uh, tucks that you have on this yellow uh, LPLC2 cell or, what is, or, the, or the blue one, the LC4. Yeah. Those things. That's that's the where is what is that? Okay, so of? so this here is in the optic lobe. So these okay. tufts are dendrites. And you can see they're actually stratified in these different layers. But then so then here are the axons extending out into now what is the central brain here. And so now these are axon terminals, elaborations of the axon terminals. Now, can I just check on something? Yeah, yeah. On the real one, which is our axon <laughs> synapses. Signed in the same way that we think of them in the vertebrate nervous system. Because I thought, I vaguely remember there's a lot of dendritic, dendrodendritic, and dendroaxonal yeah. uh, action. Simple. Like those are the wrong, looks like from those of us who are um, grounded only in warm blooded animals. That's right. It would be one way, but it's not. So, yeah, so you make the good point that in flies, things that we call dendrites also can have presynaptic terminals onto other neurons. And in fact, that is what is depicted here in this gray arrow, showing you that there are LPLC2 sort of dendrodendritic connections onto LP4 in the optic lobe. Um, so you're absolutely right. Um, but for, for the purposes of input onto the giant fiber, I think, think of it as well. that's right for, in this particular case. Yeah. Okay. So we're going to do this experiment now where we can record. So now we're not going to use optogenetics. Now we're actually going to go back to old school physiology. We're going to stick a glass electrode into the fly brain, target the giant fiber cell body with whole cell patch plant, which we're recording intracellularly. And so that's what you're seeing here in this top trace. You're seeing the giant fibers membrane potential. In this fly, which you're looking at from the front, and this is our plate that the fly is head fixed to. We have a visual screen surrounding it. Um, and we can record from the giant fiber uh, during uh, playing of looming stimuli. Let's see. Yeah, so it's a little bit faint, but there's a blue line here that's showing you timing. And so what you can sort of see is that you couldn't see it in the video. Sorry, it was kind of jumping. But when the, the giant fiber fires a single spike, and that is what initiates that fast, that short mode takeoff in the fly. And we can do this experiment now where we use our genetic tool to do that same recording, but either silencing LPLC2, from which we're going to interpret that the signals that we record in the giant fiber are just coming through this LC4 channel, or we can do the converse. Uh, we can silence LC4, and then we record the giant fiber and interpret our signals as simply coming from the LPLC2 channel. Are you stimulate these neurons and make it? Yes, yes. Uh, so, okay. We can do that um, if we express a redshifted channel rhodopsin in the whole fly uh, and then use a red light shine on the fly, the fly takes off beautifully short mode. That's what I showed you before with the optional activation. In the physiology, when we're coming in from the cell body <coughs> and we inject current, to the, a total tangent, but basically, 
there's a plateau potential that gets initiated from injection of that current it, at the cell body that blocks the sodium current from going down the axon. So we, we actually can't, by injecting current at the cell body, initiate this behavior. Um, okay, so uh, this is what we see. So I guess uh, the, the first um, way I should frame this for you is, you know, why is this interesting? Well, we're trying to understand what sets the threshold for the giant clock being activated because that's part of what's the choice between the long and the short mode. Also, we're trying to understand why would you have half of the visual uh, projection neurons that we say responsive to looming stimulus? Is there some different aspects of the looming stimulus that they're actually detecting, some different computation that these are doing? And, and we think we, we are able to understand that through this experiment. So what I'm showing you here is, um, our recording from the giant fiber, but in the case where we found LPLC2, so we think we're only recording the LC4 input, and we're showing you the response of the, um, of the giant fiber now, um, but graphed in a way where time is no longer the x-axis, instead we've taken the instantaneous angular velocity of the visual stimulus as the x-axis. So if I go back maybe to help um, orient you to that, right, so here is the uh, size of the looming stimulus over time on the fly's eye, right? So imagine the derivative of that. And then the derivative of that at any point in time is going to become our x-axis. And we're going to plot the membrane potential value for that given um, uh, velocity. And so what's being overlaid in this next plot with different colors are responses for different speeds of looming that we show the fly. And what you can basically see is that those overlay and so what that means is that it doesn't matter how fast our uh, looming stimulus is going, how fast the attack is coming. In all of those scenarios, the, uh, giant, the LC4 input to the giant fiber was faithfully recording the angular velocity of the looming stimulus, that is how fast it was expanding. So that's a particular computation about the looming that we think LC4 is doing. But why is that angular velocity different for, isn't it, I mean, it's not exactly, why do you have different, Speeds for different. Um, so maybe it doesn't matter. Yeah. I, I, okay. I'm happy to come back to that. It's basically instantaneously like how fast the, the expansion is happening, right? Okay. Let's do that now for the other experiment where we set up the four, and so we look at the LPLC two input. So same thing here. Each different color is showing you different speeds of looming. So you can see they do not overlay, right? So you're not getting sort of a clear um, function between the angular velocity of the stimulus and LPLC2's um, input to the giant fiber. But if instead on the x-axis of angular velocity, you simply put the instantaneous size of the stimulus, now what you can see is that they do overlay. So, you know, basically we think the way the system is working is that you have these different um, looming responsive neurons, which are computing very different precise aspects of the looming stimulus. Two of those in particular, one that's computing angular velocity and one that's computing um, the instantaneous size of the stimulus on the fly's retina are now being combined, right? Those are we're providing input to the giant fiber. And so, you know, we can do what, we can make a model of this. Um, we can show that basically by just providing this, the velocity and the size input to the giant fiber, that we can basically recapitulate the giant fiber's responses to these uh, different speeds of looming. And so what, what this means up here is that um, these are actually canonical con computations that seem to be represented in other animal brains. In pigeons, they've been called row cells and eta cells and locusts too. That these um, neurons that have these same types of responses have been found in other organs. And so, you know, it's a clue that, that these, uh, there's some conservation basically in the way that the brain is kind of interpreting these very salient salient ecological um, looming stimuli. Okay, here's the cartoon then of how we put this all together and how we think it's actually working to um, this distributed system to, to kind of make a decision for the fly. In the case of a slow predator attack, uh, you have um, basically only the looming size channel, that's LPLC2 activated, that's not sufficient to bring the giant fiber to threshold. And so the looming information is also in parallel being uh, provided to other descending pathways, which we know must exist, right? Because we can silence the giant fiber and find it takes off. And those other descending pathways coordinate this longer, slower, longer mode attack. However, in the case that you have a fast predator attack, now you get simultaneous activation of the velocity and the size channel 
onto the giant fiber. That coincidence is enough to bring the giant fiber to the threshold of that single site that sort of beats down the pipe, as it were, the information in the other descending channels, and that drive that rocket is moving. Yeah. So in the slow in the, in the slow case, you have kind of a kind of population folding along those fibers. Yeah. How many fibers do you uh, employ? Yes. Great question. So uh, that's the second half of the talk, which I okay. probably won't have time to get to. I'll, I'll give you like the five minutes of something. But basically, if you think it's about a dozen. Oh, yeah. Really? Yeah. So it's okay. nice because it's not two or three, but it's also not a hundred. Okay. Um, okay. So I don't know. Should I go maybe 10 more minutes? Yeah, 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 five yeah, more minutes? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, let me skip over to, let's see, where, where can we go to? That is. Okay. Oh, I, I can answer your question right now, actually. Okay. Is okay. anybody out there, by the way? There are a few. <laughs> okay. So, yeah. So, we got really interested then in these other pathways that was sort of more of a population code. And specifically, we started approaching those with the question, you know, okay, we do think they have some role in the long road pathway. Actually, we won't talk about that as much today, although we have some hypotheses about that. But could it be that they're involved in part of the directional um, posture adjustment? These other slow things that are happening before that rapid takeoff. So just to remind you, right, the fly is doing some kind of postural adjustment in response to the loomy stimuli from a particular direction that's adjusting its center of mass to these sort of target locations. Okay, so now here's a little bit of the question that you were asking. Um, what are the other descending neurons involved? So I just told you the story of these two looming sensitive visual projection neurons that both provide input to the giant fiber, which is a descending neuron. Well, it turns out there are this handful of other ones. Um, as I said, there's 10 to, 10 to 12 that we know of. Um, these are the ones I'm showing you a subset of those because these are the ones for which we had really good driver lines. So we actually could could do good experiments with them. And you can see that they all happen to get pretty strong input from LC4 in particular, that was the velocity channel. Um, and in particular, there's one, right, DMP04, this is showing you the fraction of that neuron's inputs from a, a given um, visual neuron. So it's getting a lot of its input directly from that visual neuron. Okay, so we went through, and we now are gonna screen in particular these descending neurons um, to understand if impairing them impairs the directionality of the takeoff. So, you're okay. counting the synapses? We are, yeah. So I didn't write the numbers here, okay. uh, but I just yes. wondered what the dependent measure is. Yeah, no, thank you for asking that. The, the thickness of the arrow is directly proportional to the number of synapses. Um, and, and I should say, you know, as a caveat, I think it's important to know for these synectomes, um, the way that the synapses are detected in this hemibrain data set is automatically through machine learning, right? So you basically have a human mark where synapses are, you train uh, you know, an, an algorithm to identify those automatically, and then algorithm does its thing. So it's not 100% correct necessarily. Um, but in the places where we have compared it to hand-identified data, it's you know, the main story is, is the same. Okay, so um, the first thing we did was to try to activate these other descending neurons. Um, as we've seen before, if you activate dmp one which is the giant fiber, then basically 100% of the flies take off. But there weren't any other of these other descending neurons getting alpha-4 information that when we activated gave as strong a takeoff response. Instead, what was really interesting, kind of alluding to the population control that kind of came up, was that we happened to have a couple driver lines that just by chance targeted these, um, either two or three of these descending neurons. And you can see that those ones when we activated gave the highest takeoff rate of what we observed. We don't have the, the means yet to actually do arbitrary combinations, but we kind of conjecture that if we could keep adding on more of these you know, descending neurons to activate them all at the same time, this would start to approach 100. Okay, but let's come to the directional um, observations. So when we activate one of these called DMP11, what we observe is that not all the flies take off, but the ones that do seem to go forward. So in green is the first frame of the video before uh, we show, before we started the activation. And then what you're seeing is you're seeing um, the flies movement during the activation. And so you can see, because you see green left, they're moving forward. There was another one of these found that we found DMP2, which had the converse. So if you activate DMP2, again, not all of the flies take off, um, but the flies seem to shift backwards. 
and I should say that um, th these are all flies. So, uh, or, or these are not just the flies that took off actually. So all, all the flies seem to shift backwards. They just don't all take off. Okay, so let's quantify this for you. Uh, what does this look like? If we just measure the angle between the center of mass and the middle of legs to kind of quantify this, you can see that compared to our control flies, DMP11 makes the fly shift forward. DMPO2 um, co-activation with DMPO4 makes the fly shift backwards a lot. And does this actually lead to directional takeoffs? It does. So DMP11 flies that take off tend to also take off forward. And DMPO2 flies don't take off if you only activate DMPO2, but if you co-activate them with DMPO4, they take off backwards. Side note, DMPO4 activation alone does drive flies to take off, but not in a particularly directional way. So we think that basically, in this case, DMPO2 is providing some kind of postural adjustment to drive the flies backwards with the directionality. And then it, you do need this kind of population activation to actually drive them to take off. Okay, so we wanted to look at the input that LC4 was providing to, to DMP11 and DMP2. Let me remind you all the way back to when we first talked about the fine nervous system, the observation was that, in fact, we had lost retinotopy in the glomerulite. So how is it now that we think that possibly the LC4 uh, looming input to these descending neurons is driving some kind of directional response, what's actually going on? And so what we looked at was we looked at very precisely the number of synapses that each individual LC4 neuron, there's about 50 of them, was making with each of these descending neurons. And what you see is that, in fact, they make different numbers with, uh, of, of synapses, and that the number of synapses that an LC4 makes with the descending neuron depends on its visual receptive field. So what you're looking at here is you're looking at the dendrites in the optic lobe of an individual LC4, and we've colored them according to how many synapses they make with DNP11. And so what you can see is that these um, LC4 neurons that have dendrites in the part of the object lobe, which is looking at posteriorly to the fly, make a lot of synapses. And those ones in the sort of anterior part, uh, receptor fields in the anterior part, make fewer synapses. And we see the converse for DNP2. In other words, you get these kind of gradients of synaptic connectivity that, that um, are preserving this kind of retinotomic information, even though physically, spatially, you can't observe that in the neuromill. It's actually just in the connectivity. So we wanted to see if this was actually functional. Um, you know, again, long story short, it is. Uh, Jin Yong, who's a talented electrophysiologist in the lab, did a set of recordings um, from these descending neurons where he showed looming <laughs> stimuli at different azimuthal positions around the fly. And what he found was that um, whether you're counting spikes or whether you're just looking at the area under the curve. Um, in fact, these synaptic gradients do seem to correlate directly with these kind of um, functional response gradients that go in the, in the correct direction, right? So DMP11 is most responsive to um, stimuli from the back and DMP2 to stimuli from the front. Okay, and then we were able to, uh, to create a model of this because we could actually only substitute we only sample directly experimentally a small amount of visual space, um, but our model based on uh, some anatomical uh, modeling of where we think the actual physical receptor fields are, this is work done by Art Zhao in, in uh, Michael Rogers lab, matched very well our experimental findings, which basically let us use the model to make these curves, which should be sort of the full response curves um, spatially of how the descending neurons are responding. So you can see that the architecture of the system is basically to have these um, different descending neurons that seem to be already sort of motor commands for different directions of life and a jump hooked up with these synaptic gradients um, to uh, small field visual neurons looking at different parts of space. Okay, so um, we then uh, uh, think that things work like this. Uh, looming stimuli that come from the front of the fly, uh, right? They're getting filtered in LC4, not just by this particular computation looking for velocity, but actually by this synaptic gradient filter that's particularly sensitive um, to, uh, to neurons that are coming from, or to, to stimuli that are coming from the front. And then we would connect preferentially to uh, a descending neuron driving a backwards jump. And you get the converse through a different kind of set of synaptic filters um, for, uh, for stimuli coming from the back, then get effectively connected differentially um, to the descending neuron driving the forward jump. And so we, we think that that's how at least the sort of proved forward backward um, control is going on in the fly. And I, I'd like to note two things here, if I kind of put up all of the different parts of this. 
first of all, I think what you're finally able to see in the fly is something that we have sort of been modeled and assumed a lot in neurobiology that you've never been able to see before, which is literally looking at a sensory motor transformation, right? So this has been a big question in neuroscience. You start out and you're encoding things in sensory language and sensory uh, coordinates, like the retinal coordinates, but then eventually you have to actually tell the body how to move the body coordinates. How does that coordinate transformation happen? And so here in the fly, in this particular example, you're literally seeing it happen through this particular architecture, which is these synaptic gradients, as well as um, the uh, properties of these descending neurons and how they're hooked up in the motor system. So um, it's, it's kind of cool that in the fly, we can now just directly look at that. Um, and the other thing I would say is that, you know, even though in the fly, I think we often come down to these particular uh, individual neurons for which we can find roles in behavior, it's important to remember that these are still existing in the larger context of small populations of dozens um, or, or even multiple dozens of similar neurons potentially doing similar things. And so there's still a lot for us to probe here to understand um, what other neurons might also be contributing to this control. For example, I, won't I haven't showed you here today the silencing experiments, um, but we can silence um, DNP11 and five still take off forwards. So we know, right, that this is only one of a, a, a set of, of populations coordinating this. And there's still a lot to be understood about how those architectures um, coordinate to control. Okay, with that, I'm gonna stop here. Um, I wanna make sure that I get to show you um, the folks that contributed to the work um, in the lab. Um, and, you know, at Genelia, we're, we're really fortunate to be in an incredibly collaborative environment where we not only interact with other labs, we've mentioned some of those today, um, but also a, a great set of sort of core teams that have been working on the connectome that help um, with all of the, the fly genetics um, and, 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 and much of the, the tracing and things like that. So uh, with that, thanks very much. And happy to